Okay, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up tonight. Welcome to Avalon Bookstore. Uh, we couldn't convince Groucho Marx that he wasn't dead, so instead we have Dr. Robert Anton Wilson. <laughs> Shortest and most inter interesting introductions I ever had. Uh, am I am I the only one that noticed that that one of the last things Ronald Reagan did before leaving the presidency was to have an operation on his asshole? <laughs> and, uh, one of the first things uh, George Bush did uh, on entering the presidency was to have an operation on his middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, for a man my age, and uh, there are very few, most men my age are dead already, as Casey Stengel once said. Uh, for a man my age, it's uh, profoundly embarrassing that the president and vice president are named Bush and Quail. Uh, when, I, when I was growing up, uh, Quail in Brooklyn, uh, when I was reaching puberty, Quail had only one meaning it meant vagina. And uh, I didn't find out it also meant a bird until I was about 19. Uh, adolescence in Brooklyn in the 1940s, before the sexual revolution, before the 60s, before the Kinsey reports were published, and everybody found out, gee, I'm not the only one who does that. Back in the dark ages, boys around the cusp of puberty would gather in the boys' room at the school and discuss bush and quail. Have you ever actually seen the bush? Yeah, my girl let me see a bush, but only quick for a minute, like, you know, I got two fingers of my girl's quail. And I grew up with that. Uh, bush and quail, bush and quail. <laughs> 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 adolescents, you're terrified that the grown-ups will find out you're thinking about sex, much less talking about it, and doing anything about it was absolutely out of the question. So this is all, I, I can say penis and vagina, and I'm okay. I can say prick and cunt, and I'm okay. But uh, the minute I get to quail, I'm, I'm 13 years old. I'm horrified that uh, my parents are going to find out what I'm talking about with the other boys. And now every day I pick up the newspapers and there it is, bush and quail, bush and quail. What are they doing to me? The Republican Party is out to destroy what's left of my sanity. And uh, you've all heard of the Church of the Subgenius, I trust. And you know phrase the secret. Bob. You know the secret phrase, Bob. You, you know the secret of power. What's the secret of power? Slack. Uh, no, no, no. Slack. Given how stupid, stupid, stupid the average guy is, statistically half the people are stupid. Right. But you all know how dumb the average guy is. Well, mathematically, by definition, <laughs> half of them are even dumber than that. <laughs> now, now, once you understand that, you can start your own religion and get as rich as Bob, or L. Ron Hubbard, or Roger Nish. You can have 93 Rolls Royces, though, if you just keep that in mind. Half of them are even dumber than average. And as if that's not bad enough uh, for the philosopher to contemplate, uh, if you want to make money, it's good news, but if you're a philosopher, it's bad news. On top of that, we've got an incredibly large number of people nowadays who are just plain full of shit. I mean, have you noticed that? Movie stars, they're all full of shit these days. You can get them to endorse anything. Uh, I, I heard recently, on this regard, of the Carol Hemingway show. Maybe some of you up here have heard of Carol Hemingway. It was a very good talk show. She had a woman on who gets testimonials from movie stars for various products. She's in between. She makes a good profit on it. She said, Elizabeth Taylor recently turned down a million dollars to endorse something because she thought it was a rotten product. And suddenly I fell in love with Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> well, these years, I just thought she's uh, <laughs> another Hollywood bubblehead, you know, uh, some acting talent, quite a bit of acting talent in some of her roles. 
But now I'm in love with her. This woman turned down a million dollars just on a matter of principle. I mean, you can hardly find that these days. Uh, movie stars will endorse anything, and baseball players are even worse. You know, baseball players will get up there on television with their bare face hanging out and say, I never thought I'd like eating lepers, turds. That would give me that competitive edge I need. I think they'll, they'll do anything for money. <laughs> <laughs> AIDS is good for you. I haven't been so I've never been so happy as when I got AIDS. Come and get your injection. They'll say it. You pay them enough money. So we get all these stupid people, and then we get all these celebrities who are full of shit. And then if you look around, you'll find out that at least thirty percent of the population are batshit crazy. Right? <laughs> well, on Santa Cruz, it's about sixty <laughs> percent. So, so you, you, you got the just plain stupid, you got the ones who are full of shit, and you got the ones who are batshit crazy, and now we end up with a vice president who's all three at once. <laughs> and he has to be named Quail, too. <laughs> he, goes down to Latin, he goes down to Latin America, he's in Brazil, he apologizes to the crowd because he can't speak Latin. <laughs> he was speaking to the Negro uh, United Negro College Fund and he tried to quote their slogan and he said it's a terrible thing to lose your mind <laughs> I mean, it's a terrible waste to lose your mind I mean <laughs> well anyhow I'm not going to do Dan Quayle jokes though, he's too easy <laughs> besides yes uh, he had a great record in, uh, during the Vietnam War uh, as soon as the Viet Cong found out that dangerous Dan had joined the Indiana National Guard. They gave up all plans to invade Terre Haute. Most people don't realize that. What I want to know is, have all these years of Playboy Center trolls been conditioning us to accept this Bush and Quail in the White House? Bush and Quail, Bush and Quail. You know the difference between Playboy, Penthouse, and Hustler? This is of no interest to the women in the audience, but uh, I'll get to the women later. Uh, the difference between Playboy, Penthouse, and Hustler, I spent a lot of time meditating on this. <laughs> Philosophers have to think about everything, you know, even the most trivial matters. In Playboy, the women look like they want you to make love to them, right? In Penthouse, they look like they get tired waiting and they start making love to themselves. And in Hustle, they look like they're having a gynecological examination. <laughs> now you know the difference. And now you know the three types of males who buy the three different magazines. The way we have three of them. There's a lot of inferior invitations, but those are the three major ones. These are the three basic approaches to Bush and Quail. And that's why we got Bush and Quail running the country. I hope that's clear. <laughs> Uh, I'm supposed to speak tonight about the Western Hermetic tradition. I've spoken and written so much about the Western Hermetic tradition that it bores me. Uh, however, I'll say something about the Western Hermetic tradition. Uh, you know, uh, the earth is hollow, of course. Everybody here knows that. You, you wouldn't be in a, an occult bookstore in Santa Cruz if you didn't know the earth is hollow. February 1990, we all know that. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, one of the people who knew it was Jules Verne. Uh, that's why he wrote Journey to the Center of the Earth. As a matter of fact, it's in several of Jules Verne's novels. And if you get a hold of Michael Lamy's book, Jules Verne, Initiate and Initiator, you'll find out Jules Verne was a member of the Priory of Sion. You see, we're getting into the Western occult tradition after all. Now, who are the Priory of Sion? Well, according to this book, Jules Verne, Initiate and Initiator, the Priory of Sion were formed in the 1890s as a front for the Illuminati of Bavaria, who had decided to go underground and conceal their existence and set up a front organization to recruit people. So the Priory of Sion are the old Illuminati of Bavaria, still in business under a new name. And Jules Verne was one of their highest initiates. Hey, you're getting real heavy secret stuff tonight. This is what you paid for, I trust. <laughs> and one of the major secrets of the Priory of Sion is that the earth is hollow, contrary to what profane science thinks. The earth is hollow, and there's an opening that goes right down to the center of the earth. I've read the Chateau in southern France, near the Spanish border, 
as a church there. It's called the Church of Mary Magdalene. And it says over the door, this place is terrible. And if you go down to the <laughs> cellar of that church and press the right brick at the right time, uh, uh, a staircase opens leading down, and you go right down to the center of the earth, which is full of superhuman beings who are immortal, who never die. They have the secret of immortality. And they are going to give it to the human race when we're ready for it. But we're not ready for it yet. But the purpose of the Priory of Zion is to get us ready for it. Okay. <laughs> you know how many Freemasons it takes to change a light bulb? <laughs> That's a craft secret. <laughs> The uh, Michael LeVay's theory that the Priory of Zion are alive with immortal superhuman beings who live in the center of the hollow earth, and you can get in through a uh, door in that church, the Church of Mary Magdalene in Rendle Chateau. That's only, uh, actually, that may not be the whole truth. I hate to disillusion you, but just because you buy a book in a New Age bookstore doesn't mean that everything in it is true. Uh, if you buy one of my books, at least half of it is actually crazy. <laughs> I, I, I believe... Uh, well, my attitude towards the readers is an absolutely sadistic one. In the sense that I don't use the word. E. Cummings said to Ezra Pound once, You damned sadist, I can see what you're up to. You're trying to force your readers to think. Well, that is a pretty sadistic thing to do. <laughs> if you go to school, the first thing they teach you is to stop thinking. All children are born, as uh, Buckminster Fuller noticed, uh, all children are born naked, hungry, and intensely curious. And uh, as soon as they start talking, well, even before they start talking, being a parent uh, consists chiefly of following them around the house, showing, don't put that in your mouth. <laughs> That's because the oral bio-survival circuit turns on right after birth, and the first thing they want is mommy's titty. And the second thing they want is to test the rest of the world to see if it's as good as mommy's titty. <laughs> <laughs> this is as good as mommy's titty. Now, you know what their carpet tastes like, right? <laughs> Of course, everybody here goes with the carpet tastes like because you put it in your mouth. You know what the dirt in the flower pot tastes like? You know what everything tastes like. Because this is the first circuit of the nervous system that's activated. If you want to know about the other seven circuits, buy my book, Prometheus Rising. That's what I'm here for, is to sneak in subtle little books in my books. Don't no borrow uh, The... As soon as they learn to talk, as, uh, as I was saying, uh, they stop testing everything by putting it in their mouth, and they try to find out by wiggling their mouth. And they figure out these sounds that grown-ups make have meaning. They start asking questions. And uh, parenting then consists of saying, well, gee, I don't know. I'll go look it up in the encyclopedia. <laughs> they find the most fascinating questions. Why is the sky blue? Uh, well, gee, it's always been blue as far back as I can remember. Uh, maybe it's full of orgone energy. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Why is the sky blue? Well, it's the reflection of lakes and oceans. Uh, now, wait a minute. And, uh, and the next one, why does it rain? Well, there's uh, the excess moisture in the clouds, I think, or something like that. But then they want to know, uh, why is America here and not in Africa? Well, uh, <laughs> and uh, the function of the public school system is to put a stop to that. If we had a population... Uh, who kept the curiosity of small children. People would be going around trying to find out everything for themselves. And uh, such intense curiosity is likely to tumble the whole edifice of uh, authoritarian society. There's a bridge in Amsterdam. Well, there are a lot of bridges in Amsterdam, <laughs> aren't there? Yeah. There's one particular bridge in Amsterdam. You go over it and you find yourself on E-Tunnel. And there's a great coffee house there, which has a sign in it that says, No hard drugs, please, which I love. <laughs> it's, the, it's so civilized. It's so natal on. It's, it's the essence of Dutchness. No hard drugs, please. <laughs> it's not quite, it reminds me of when Nancy Reagan was popularizing Just Say No. 
And Timothy Leary said, we can be more polite than Republicans. Say, no, thank you. <laughs> and I said, no, my drugs, please. This is a, a typical Amsterdam coffee house, which means that you can buy a hashish cigarette with your coffee, which does do a lot to add to the flavor of coffee. <laughs> and, and it does a lot for the chocolate buns, too. And, but no hard drugs, please. That's, uh, that's so civilized and, and Dutch. Because really, you're sitting around in one of those nice Amsterdam coffee shops with a bunch of friends drinking coffee, blowing bad, <coughs> relaxed, at peace with the world. Uh, you think, uh, gee, every, every, someday the whole world would be like Amsterdam. <coughs> That'd be wonderful. And you don't want somebody in the corner or <laughs> they work something, they ready to shove the needle in. It lowers the whole tumult of these <laughs> So, no hard drugs, please. Uh, I love Amsterdam. But anyway, there's the bridge you cross over there. It says under the bridge, abuse of authority comes as no surprise. <laughs> One of the most profound political statements I have ever encountered. Abuse of authority comes as no surprise. And authority cannot survive question, especially authority that's based on nothing but bluff. And since governments are based principally on force and deception, Democratic governments are based chiefly on deception, other governments on force. In democratic governments, if you get too uppity, they give up on the deception and they resort to brute force again, as a lot of us found out in the 60s. Those who didn't find out in the 60s will find out in the 90s, because we're going to have a rerun of the 60s. And uh, so they don't want people going around asking questions. So the question is, how do you stop this natural human curiosity? and this incredible intelligence that humans are born with. All humans seem born with a very high IQ compared to chimpanzees, orangutans, dogs, cats, etc. Uh, like a dog. You notice the dogs don't have any sense of time whatsoever. You know, you go out the door, and you remember you forgot your wallet, and you go back in, and the dog says, ah, I thought you'd never go back, I thought you'd never go back. Thank God you're back, thank God you're back. You never did worry how to use the can opener. I thought I'd never see the dog go again. It's the same thing you've been gone for two weeks, you know. I thought I'd never see you again. Uh, they, they, uh... Cats are cool. Cats. Did you ever see a cat walk right into a glass uh, French door? You know, a cat will walk right into a dining table. And they won't admit they were surprised. Oh, their, whole, their whole career depends on seeming smart in the dorms. Beings feel inferior. The whole cat shtick. It's look how imperturbable I am. Look how cool and serene. You want to know Buddhism, man? <laughs> so a cat walks into the glass, bang, turns around. I meant that, I intended that. I don't want people to think stupid. I know what I'm doing. You follow the cat, you see it's hiding behind the couch going, <laughs> I mustn't rip off too much of George Carlin's material. <laughs> oh, we'll never get this on the radio. <laughs> so public schools were founded, and uh, human IQ began decreasing immediately. There was there were actually studies done, quoted in Paul Goodman's book, Growing Up Absurd. Paul Goodman, Growing Up Absurd. Just so you don't think I'm making this up. There have actually been studies done in many schools in, in uh, the big cities where IQ measurably decreases from the entering of grammar school to the graduation from high school. The longer they're there, the dumber they get. And uh, uh, some people think that's an accident or an oversight or a mistake. But that is the function of the public schools. The function of the public schools is to stop thinking. The idea is to teach people the Cinecine level of intelligence. They want us to go back before the primate level. I see a few puzzled frowns. Cinecine comes from the Latin. <laughs> it means uh, to repeat like a parrot. Uh, Cinecineism is the habit of repeating whatever you hear. 
All brainwashing movements are based on getting people to repeat things together. Like, Sig Heil, Sig Heil, Sig Heil, or uh, there's a right-wing nut on the radio down in L.A. named Wally something. Or I can't even remember his Wally last name. Wally George. George. Yeah, I can't even remember his last name. I, you turn him on, and the first thing you hear, he's got this uh, record which simulates a live audience. And he made this damn record himself, you know, and has a whole bunch of voices chanting, Wally, Wally, Wally. And you suddenly realize it's the same beat, Satan Hile, Satan Hile, Satan Hile, it's the same old trick. And he comes on and starts raving, This is a Christian country. I think all the non Christians should be thrown out of the country right now. Then he gets phone calls and insults everybody who disagrees with him. And then he plays, Wally, Wally, Wally. You think, Jesus, I lived through this in the 30s. What's going on here? Uh, the people, after eight years of grammar school and four years of high school, most people are ready for that sort of thing because they have been taught you never think, you never judge, you never trust your senses, you never report what you see, hear, smell, or any way surmise from the environment. You repeat what the teacher tells you. If they catch you thinking, you get a lower mark. I, uh, I one time got a C on a term paper at Brooklyn Polytechnic. It was the longest term paper in the whole class. I checked that out. It had more footnotes than any other paper. They were all accurate footnotes, all the proper apparatus of scholarship. And why did I get a C? I asked the teacher, why did I get such a low mark? These guys are all these little short papers, got A's, and I get this C for this big, long philosophical paper. He said, engineers don't write like that. You must have plagiarized it. He caught me thinking. That's the one thing they can't stand, is if they catch you thinking, they've got to find some excuse to punish you. You're not supposed to think. You're supposed to repeat what you hear. And almost all books are written on that principle. Books are written, this is the truth. I have found out the truth. I will not explain it in chapter one. I'll explain a little more in chapter two. In chapter three, I'll summarize chapter one and chapter two to make sure you get it. Then in chapter four, I'll tell you a little more. Then in chapter five, I'll repeat it a different way. Then in chapter six, I'll tell it to you again. Now you better believe it. I've proven it. Now go and tell all your friends to buy this book so they'll learn the truth too. And people who have been through our educational system, they think, uh, they think they're thinking when they're, just, when they're just repeating like parrots. So I set out to sabotage the whole system by writing books that nobody can believe. <laughs> you believe one part, you take any book of mine and you believe the first 30 pages, you can't believe the next 30 pages. <laughs> If you somehow make a synthesis between them on some upper Hegelian level, this is the thesis, this is the antithesis, and somehow I'll make a synthesis up here, you find the next 30 pages throw you into an entirely different reality tunnel. By the time you get to the end, you don't know what, when I'm kidding and when I'm telling the truth. And for force, you either have to start thinking, which is how people end up in seminars like this, <laughs> where they throw the book across the room and they say, what's this son of a bitch up to? I think he should be banned. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is my whole approach. And it horrifies me that somebody, uh, that somebody might believe something I've written. Because I know how fallible I am. I've had to live with myself for 58 years, and I know what a schmuck I can be. And the thought that somebody's going to set me up as an idol and say it must be true because Robin Anton Wilson wrote it, that is such a terrifying thought <laughs> that I perforce had to invent this style of paradox and play to prevent people from thinking they're getting the truth out of my books. What you're getting out of my books is my guesses, my hunches, sometimes my prejudices. Uh, but I don't know. Unlike the Pope, the Ayatollah, uh, Roger Nish, Carl Sagan, and all the other prophets of all the various. Uh, I don't claim to know the truth. All I claim to know is little hunks of what I've experienced and guesses I've made. Like I guess, I guess there's a world external to my brain. I can't prove it. But it seems more reasonable because I have pretty good luck. Most of the time when I'm writing and I want a cup of coffee, 
I had pretty good luck I had pretty good luck at getting up from the word processor out the door down the hall into the kitchen to the coffee machine and bringing back coffee and I don't think that would work as often as it does if there were no real world out there <laughs> I know there are philosophers who can prove there is no real world out there but I find it more convenient to assume that there is I also assume I don't know anything about it uh, except how to find the coffee uh, beyond that it gets more and more perplexing and confusing uh, <clears throat> for instance according to Girard de Sade's La Rasse Fabulous published uh, in Paris in 1973 uh, de Chien Louis and my French is lousy you don't have to tell me <laughs> I do better at German well, a little better uh, I saw a sign uh, going through uh, Bavaria in November uh, looking out the window I'm reading all the street signs in the towns we're going to trying to translate them and of course German street names are very long and they're starting to blur in my head because some of them go by so fast I can't translate them in my German it's not that great that I can translate them as I see all these weird things finally I saw one that said Heilige Fliegende Kinderscheiße Strasse <laughs> I said oh no that can't be but it was 10, 20 miles back by then <laughs> I'm never get back there find it. could it possibly be a Heilige Fliegende Kinderscheiße Strasse <laughs> those of you who speak German explain that to me <laughs> <laughs> Gerard de Sade, La Rasse Fabulous, uh, 1973, also deals with the Priory of Sion. He explains that the works of Nostradamus do not deal with the future. Most people think Nostradamus deals with the future, which makes for a lot of puzzles because if you start studying the history of interpretations of Nostradamus you find everything in Nostradamus has been interpreted a different way every century there are quatrains in there that some people thought referred to Napoleon then later on they decided they referred to Bismarck then later on they decided they, re no, uh, they, decided they referred to Kaiser Wilhelm later it was Winston Churchill or Adolf Hitler and uh, then it was Ronald Reagan and uh, <laughs> They were all highly ambiguous. Uh, a couple of months ago, had an earthquake here. Uh, before your earthquake, there was a big earthquake panic in Los Angeles because some cuckoo let out that he had deciphered one of these mysterious verses of Nostradamus, and it said everybody in Los Angeles was going to get dumped in the Pacific Ocean, going to get shaken like martinis, and then dumped <laughs> in the Pacific Ocean on such and such a day and a lot of people actually left Los Angeles I, I read this quatrain from Nostradamus and it seemed to me it could refer to any city any day and any natural calamity it wasn't even necessarily an earthquake it could have referred to a cyclone in Miami but people got terrorized and fled to Los Angeles which is all to the good it's too crowded down there anyway <laughs> the only thing to be said for Malathion spraying is that it's going to thin out the population <laughs> those with the less hardy genes will die and the tough ones will survive uh, according to the said uh, this uh, simulation of prophecy in Nostradamus is all a big hoax this is just to keep Nostradamus in print by attracting the superstitious and gullible meanwhile as long as Nostradamus is in print what he actually deals with is not the future but the past what Nostradamus' quatrains refer to is the hidden history of the past, especially the past of France. And the hidden history of the past of France, as Gerard de Sade deciphers it from Nostradamus' quatrains, is full of the most amazing things you've never heard of before. The old royal family of France, the Merovingians, uh, I will not attempt the French pronunciation at all. I will not even make an effort at it. I'll the English called them Merovingians, and I can pronounce that, so they're Merovingians for tonight. The French royal family up until the 8th to the 9th century, the Merovingians, disappeared entirely. Nobody knows what became of them. The last Merovingian king, Dagobert II, was murdered in the Ardennes Forest on December 23rd, 789. Why December 23rd? Oh, well. No, I don't want to get into that. Uh, 
Uh, the uh, why the odd done forest, which is named after a bear goddess. No, we shouldn't get into that either. That'll, that'll just lead us down by, into further obscurity. The uh, and the Merovingian uh, um, Dagobert disappeared for several hundred years from history. He was considered one of the mythical kings until somebody in the 18th century, at the dawn of modern historical uh, science, when they went back to original text and compared one text with another and started applying scientific method history, they proved Dagobert really existed. Why was he murdered and why was he obliterated from history for several hundred years? Well, according to Girard, this said, the Merovingians were systematically wiped out by the Vatican. The Vatican had to get rid of all the Merovingians because the Merovingians posed a serious threat to them. The Merovingians were descended from the tribe of Benjamin in ancient Israel and Old Testament days and their mates, who were not human. The tribe of Benjamin intermarried with extraterrestrials from a planet in the system of the Syria, the star Sirius. And uh, the Orthodox Hebrews drove them out of Israel for this abominable sin of mating with extraterrestrials. They moved to Arcadia in Greece, which they named after a bear goddess. And then they moved to the Ardennes region in France, which they named after another bear goddess. That's B-E-A-R, not B-A-R-E. Uh, although Artemis, whose name means bear in Greek, was a bear goddess and a bear goddess if you read the Acteon legend. Uh, the, uh, the descendants of this uh, intermarriage between extraterrestrials from Sirius and ancient Israelites became the Merovingian dynasty who have superhuman powers and long hair that goes, goes down the back of their neck and down the back of their spine. And uh, the Vatican tried to wipe them all out, but a few of them still survive. And they and their allies make up the Priory of Sion, a secret society devoted to bringing the science of Sirius to Earth when we're ready for it. Now that's a little bit different than the theory in Michael LeMay's book, isn't it? Uh, that's another reason I don't claim to tell the truth. I don't know how to find out the truth. I just collect theories and guess which one of them sounds more plausible. So far, neither of these sound very plausible to me. But I like the one about Sirius because there was a period in 1973 when I was getting communications from Sirius, or thought I was. And then in 1974, my friend Phil Dick started getting communications from Sirius, too, or I thought he was. And uh, so I've always been intrigued with Sirius. Oh, I eventually decided I wasn't getting communications from Sirius. A psychic named Penny Looney told me I was channeling an ancient Chinese philosopher. And I started to try to make tests to see whether it was an extraterrestrial from Sirius or a Chinese philosopher. And I found either one worked. <laughs> I seem to fit the data, just like the way even particle models and quantum mechanics. And then another psychic told me I was channeling a medieval Irish bard, which made a lot of sense to me because I'd always been attracted to the medieval Irish poetry. And if a medieval Irish bard was trying to use me as a channel all my life, I would. That's why I would have gotten so involved with Irish uh, literature. Uh, but then I saw the movie Harvey. <laughs> which is about a uh, fellow named Elwood P. Dowd in some city in Ohio who comes out of a bar one night and meets a six foot tall white rabbit lounging against the lamppost and the rabbit says to him how are you this evening Mr. Dowd and in the movie when Elwood tells this to the psychiatrist his sister has taken him to the psychiatrist says weren't you surprised and Elwood says no it's a small town everybody knows my name <laughs> <laughs> uh, the six foot tall white rabbit is a is well known in County Kerry. He's called the Puka, uh, which some uh, linguist claims is the earliest Indo-European form of the word, which became bog in Russian and god in English. It's the, it means the divinity, the divinity. The earliest divinity of Europe was a giant rabbit, according to some theories. And this giant rabbit still survives in County Kerry, where in modern Gaelic he's called the Puka. And occasionally some of them wander as far as Ohio. <laughs> in that play. There's a skeptical psychiatric orderly in the play named Wilson. And he looks up Puka in the dictionary. And the, dic and the definition he finds in the dictionary 
is Puka N, a Celtic elf or vegetation spirit, wise but mischievous, fond of rump pots, crack pots, and how are you tonight, Mr. Wilson? Uh, well, when I, when I saw that on television, I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm like Phil Deck, the television is talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to experimentally take the attitude that what was communicating with me or through me was a six foot tall white rabbit from County Kerry. <laughs> and I found that made as much sense as assuming it was an extraterrestrial or an ancient Chinese philosopher or a medieval Irish bard. So I adopted the six foot tall white rabbit from Kerry because there is absolutely no danger that I might take that literally. <laughs> and I think when you're dealing with these processes, the worst danger is what the Sufis call literalism. Never be literable, literal, literal. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> ovular. There's an ovular shape on the floor. There is no such word as ovular. He denies that there's such a word as ovular. Put that in the book. You recognize that? That's from Weston Wells' version of the trial. Uh, uh, if you don't like the six foot tall white rabbit from County Kerry, you can call it the left, uh, the right hemisphere of the brain, or you can call it the collective unconscious. Anyway, the uh, whether I was getting messages from Sirius or from my own unconscious or the collective unconscious or what lies even deeper than the collective unconscious, according to Jung, the psychoid level, which is the same in all animals, not just in humans, and it's also the same in inanimate matter as it is in animate matter, and it has the quantum characteristic of non-locality, so it, it includes all space and all time, which explains why you often get precognition on this level, uh, which is what Jung calls synchronicity, one student of Jung tells about a time at the Jung Institute when they were having one of these incredible coincidences after another. And this student said to Jung, I can't understand all this. And he said, it's just synchronicity. And then the next day there was more of it. The student said, how can, how can the synchronicity keep on happening like this? Jung said, okay, it's demons. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my approach is it's the, it's the non-local level of mind as described by the great quantum physicist Evan Harris Walker in his paper, The Complete Quantum Anthropologist. And anybody who can understand the mathematics in Walker's paper, it's a six foot tall white rabbit from County <laughs> Gary. That you can understand, right? Just don't take it literally. Anyway, uh, there's a church in uh, Stenay, uh, which was uh, one of the capitals of the Merovingian dynasty which is oriented so that if you stand by the altar and look out the door in the summer, you'll see Sirius framed right in the doorway leading into the church. And uh, the son compares this to the church of Mary Magdalene in Rendlish Chateau, in which the 14 stations of the cross have many oddities which have never been explained. For instance, there's a Scotchman in kilts watching the crucifixion. You will not find this in either the Christian Bible or in any of the Gnostic Bibles. You'll also find some people carrying Jesus out of the tomb in the middle of the night, as if he didn't die at all. They were about to fake a resurrection. And it says over the door, this place is terrible. Well, according to uh, this, this was built by a uh, priest named Father Sonnier in the 1890s. Uh, according to the said, uh, the, these 14 stations of the cross contain